Hi everybody! Welcome back to 17 Karat K-Pop and my recap of the latest news in K-Pop and beyond. So much to get to, you know I don't like long intros, so let's get started. Story number one about Jane Wanyan and her win in court. If you follow K-pop companies on social media, you know it's pretty common for them to issue statements saying we are investigating or pursuing charges against someone who defamed our artists. Defamation suits or threats of suits, not uncommon. But this case stands out to me because it was international. Basically, for a while, someone posting rumors about Jane Wanyan was unknown. Anonymous, couldn't track who it was, but long story short, because of a court proceeding out of California, they were able to figure out who this person was. So then other agencies who had been on this person's case, Big Hit Music and KQ Entertainment, had their criminal complaints moving, no longer stagnant. The issues with this poster have apparently been ongoing since 2022, but the legal system is nothing if not slow and laborious. But they finally pinned down the defamer and bring charges against a California-based defamation incident. That could set a new precedent. Like, overseas YouTubers can't claim immunity from South Korean legal repercussion if they're not in South Korea. The internet is really transforming perceptions of legal boundaries where laws start and end or never do. So the issues were around since at least 2022 that we know of. The ruling was issued December 2023. The news broke this story to the public mid-January. Not sure why. The discrepancy may be because the court ruling was right before Christmas. I don't know. There are apparently three, as of recording time, lawsuits against the defamer, who I'm intentionally not naming to publicize. Two civil lawsuits, one criminal. Wanyan is both suing as her own entity, and Starship Entertainment separately is suing. So in the future, if you hear a court update that references her or Starship Entertainment, that is not necessarily in reference to vice versa too. Separate legal cases. The defamer made up stories about Wanyan. Allegedly, I guess I have to say still. Some claim the defamer even offered to pay other people to post derogatory online commentary and would pay more the more detailed and mean your post was. However, the only place I could trace that claim back to concretely is like a Reddit type board. So reputability, not super concrete. But either way, it's bad enough to defame someone whether or not there was actually this effort to recruit others to do it too. So there's a pending defamation trial, but a legal victory has been found in one case where they sued for 100 million won, which is over 74k USD. Around January 24th of this year, the defamer filed an injunction to block this order that he pay the damages compensation. So that order can be blocked pending outcomes of related cases. So basically, a couple of big legal issues for this defamer to deal with. One, verdict has now been against them, but they still face verdicts and are kind of resisting admitting to and paying up for the first loss. I'll keep you posted, but now let's talk about a litigious company, to put it lightly, in Monster Energy Drinks. Monster Energy Drinks sued over the girl group Baby Monster's band name, claiming copyright infringement for using the word monster. What interested me more than that story was how it fits into this broader interesting history of this company. Monster Beverage Company has an enormous, enormous history of doing this, of hounding people who use the word monster in what they release, from mom and pop shops to big name brands, video game titles, franchises of all kinds, you name it. They filed over 1,000 trademark suits, and that was just by 2019. So by 2019, over a thousand who knows what they're up to now they really have been the trademark bully poster children mostly about the word monster but the word beast too they sometimes go after people for so it's a wild twist actually that the beastie boys sued them in 2012 winning after a jury ruled in favor of the boys so monster energy had to pay them 1.7 million And in addition to the jury order that Monster Energy had to pay the Beastie Boys $1.7 million for copyright infringement, the judge additionally fined the company $668 million. Yet they keep filing suits of their own and losing. 
Just to name a few specifics, the candy Monster Nuts, Monster Pizza in the UK, Thirsty Beasts, a UK beverage company, BevReview.com, the Monster Hunter franchise, Pokemon, which has existed before Monster Energy ever started, but still, hey, you copied us, The Brewery, Thunder Beast LLC, Sega's Neon Monster line, a local welder, the Vermonster drink from a brewery, an indie game developer release, Dark Deception, Monsters and Mortals, MonsterFishKeepers.com, Gentle Monster, a fashion brand, the list goes on and on. Now why do they do this if they keep losing and it sounds ridiculous, like this centuries old word you can't claim ownership of like that. But like I said, they are the, the poster child of a trademark bully. Honestly, I think it's just for publicity in an all press is good press way. It also is a way you can kind of indirectly stamp out competition. If you've got a brewery that's selling a monster drink, maybe they would lose a copyright lawsuit but the brewery they sued might run out of money in legal fees. So it may just be a tactic to financially run dry their enemies, who they put on their hit list, basically. In terms of business, they just want to drain you of time, money, and resources. So win or lose the lawsuit, they feel like they've won, or at least weakened potential competition. And they continue to do this, the most recent being them suing Baby Monster, YG Entertainment specifically. And yes, YG Entertainment has won. In an interesting twist, both the Gentle Monster lawsuit for the eyewear brand Jenny from Blackpink models for, and the lawsuit in YG's favor over Baby Monster, so both YG Entertainment artist-related lawsuits, were won in a court in Singapore. What do you know? But yeah, all over the world, they've lost verdicts left and right, but they keep doing it, and unfortunately, it kind of keeps working. Monster Energy drinks are still a big deal, but next time you buy from them, think about that history. Some more legal and criminal repercussions. A K-pop ticket swindler was recently sentenced to six years in prison. By selling fake concert tickets, he got $450,000 from his targets. This 30-year-old man was found guilty in a Seoul district court, and he soon after appealed, but I wouldn't hold your breath for that. He went further, too, fraudulently pretending to sell game tokens, cameras, gift certificates. The scalping trend we talked about a bit in some past episodes not stopping anytime soon, although maybe a prison sentence like this will deter some people, but past bad actors have really had an impact beyond lining their own pockets. Like mid-January, Lim Yun Moon's agency canceled over 100 purchases for tickets to his show under suspicion of illegitimate purchases. Under suspicion of scalpers for Jane Bum Jean's show, they canceled all ticket sales. Under suspicion the prices were just getting artificially jacked up. So the whole ticketing process, they restructured to a raffle thanks to bad actors. So these types of stories I would not expect to go away anytime soon. Unless, like I said, that prison sentence spooks some of them off. The artist Rain had a stalker who recently was sentenced to six months in jail. She was convicted of stalking both him and his girlfriend, actress Kim Taehee. Her sentence also includes 40 mandated hours of psychological treatment. Her mental illness, as well as the fact she is just a first-time offender, factored into just the six-month sentence. Since in South Korea, stalking is punishable by up to three years in prison, so she got one-sixth of the maximum time, but they keep in mind mental illness, they factored that in. So I think 40 hours of that treatment with six months locked up, what do you guys think? I think that's pretty fair. It's been repeated quite a bit, though. She went uninvited to his house again and again in 2022. Then she was ordered to stay away. She didn't. Went back in 2023. She also went into his business a few months later. And she probably would have kept popping up if they didn't put her in jail. But who knows? Lastly, in this category of news... Sun John from Infinite has vowed to take legal action against SPK Entertainment. He claimed he was never properly paid or supported by them. I'll keep you posted as that case develops. How about something a bit lighter? Let's talk 17. They give us so many updates, so many exciting announcements, even when they're not in full group promo mode. Like comeback season is every day with them. 
Hoshi spoiled on a live stream that yeah, Seventeen does plan to have some US concerts this year. A spoiler he didn't even wait longer than like 24 or 48 hours to give after the follow tour. So excited to see them again. I hope they either have a fantastic Chicago venue booked or a big event at the Sphere and a free pass for me. They also had a show, debuted a new song, The Meaning of Meeting. Really wonderful. Woozy also recently released a touching song upon his promise to release it on Moonbin's birthday. It's called What Kind of Future. They also announced an extension of the Follow Asia tour through May. So maybe a Summerfest or other summer festival U.S. gig will be soon after, fingers crossed. Meanwhile, the first award of the year was a Bonsang at the 33rd Soul Music Awards. They got new magazine covers, including Vernon for GQ Korea and Jun Han for Men's No-No. Soon Guan was a special guest on Mnet show Build Up. The album FML won a day sing at the Golden Disc Awards. The Billboard Box Score Top Tours report has the follow Japan shows near the top of the list for highest grossing last year, with 72,200 attendees and $7.1 million in revenue. Follow was historic and made 17 the only Asian act on the latest report. Lastly, there was a 69% increase in blood donations after the Korean Red Cross said, donate blood and we'll give you 17 photo cards. Would you give up blood for a photo card? I would. Maybe that's my question of the day for this episode. Now let's talk about this TikTok situation, about the music industry more broadly. You probably already know Universal Music Group had a partnership with TikTok. The licensing agreement expired. They could not come to a consensus to renew it. So Universal Music has been taking a stand against TikTok. So Universal Artists and Universal Subsidiary Artists songs are now muted, unavailable in your TikToks. So in the K-pop world, this affects artists from JYP, HYBE, CUBE, some SM Entertainment artists, Blackpink, including solo stuff, TRI-B, Jensomi, Say, Dean, Taeyang. The reasons for the move were laid out in a statement by Universal Music called Why We Must Call Time Out on TikTok. About the decision, which happened when the contract officially expired January 31st, I won't read the full statement, but I do want to quote quite a bit from it. In our contract renewal discussions, we've been pressing them on three critical issues. Appropriate compensation, protecting human artists from the harmful effects of AI, and online safety. TikTok proposed paying our artists and songwriters at a rate that is a fraction of the rate that similarly situated major social platforms pay. Today, as an indication of how little TikTok compensates artists and songwriters, despite its massive and growing user base, TikTok accounts for only about 1% of our total revenue. Ultimately, TikTok is trying to build a music-based business without paying fair value for the music. TikTok is allowing the platform to be flooded with AI-generated recordings, and then demanding a contractual right which would allow this content to massively dilute the royalty pool for human artists. Further, TikTok makes little effort to deal with the vast amounts of content that infringe our artist's music, and it has offered no meaningful solutions to the rising tide of content adjacency issues, let alone the tidal wave of hate speech, bigotry, bullying, and harassment. As our negotiations continued, TikTok attempted to bully us into accepting a deal worth less than the previous deal, far less than fair market value, and not reflective of their exponential growth. TikTok's tactics are obvious, use its platform to hurt vulnerable artists, and try to intimidate us into conceding to a bad deal that undervalues music and shortchanges artists and songwriters, as well as their fans. We will never do that. We honor our responsibilities. Intimidation and threats will never cause us to shirk those responsibilities. Unquote. A TikTok rep issued this statement, in part, quote, It is sad and disappointing, despite Universal's false narrative and rhetoric, the fact is they have chosen to walk away from the powerful support of a platform with well over a billion users that serves as a free promotional and discovery vehicle for their talent, unquote. Meanwhile, Warner Music Group's CEO is kind of enjoying this, and he said, yeah, I'm good with our deal with TikTok, no issues there, and I trust their deal will be mended eventually. The platform's helpful. 
So Universal essentially argues you were misusing our artist's work by not making sure AI copycats were taking some of the royalty money away, by not filtering out certain content. It would appear next to harassing content, concerning content. You were not moderating this and treating it with the care it should have had when put through your app. And you just in general have not been paying fairly despite growing revenue that has not grown. The paychecks you dole out to the artist whose music makes your platform thrive and earn more money in the first place. So TikTok said, we do enough for you in terms of free publicity. So not saying, yeah, we deny underpaying you, but we do pay you through free promo. You should be grateful for it. You're asking too much of us to be reasonable. Honestly, I really am tempted to agree more with Universal on this. I do want to make the disclosure that I'm kind of biased in their favor because I've interviewed quite a few artists from their subsidiaries before, like Tribe, Under Republic Records, etc. So I do kind of have conflict of interest maybe a bit in this. But that being said, if you think about the hypothetical of if Universal had not made these issues public versus doing so, and then you think about the potential future of our artists on TikTok and the future of fair compensation, the future of knowing how protected your copyrighted passion projects are once you put them into a different company's hands in a way. I think I'm leaning towards supporting them bringing these issues to light as opposed to letting the music stand. Sorry, I know it's annoying, so much muted music, but in a way, abstractly, I see this similar to the writer's strike from the past summer. Where in the moment you're like, personally like, ugh, my favorite shows are delayed, they're not filming my favorite movies anymore, certain projects I was looking forward to might be shelved indefinitely, this strike is ruining my entertainment plans. But you gotta support the strikers when you think about, well, what kind of future do I want? I want them to fight for a future where they feel fairly compensated and they feel like there are doors open for the next generation of writers who make our favorite shows. So we're fighting for their future in the long run, it will be worth the impatience we're dealing with. So that inconvenience that pays off in the long run, this might be the same kind of in the broad, abstract way situation where it's annoying for now, but we'll be glad we supported UMG in this because the alternative is a future where artists' work is further and further and further devalued through AI dupes, lack of legal protection or lack of financial compensation, through just misappropriation, through lack of vetting how it presents itself, it takes so much agency away from the work. Now, I do feel awful for the more up-and-coming artists because TikTok truly has been a great way to find new music. I've heard a lot of great songs for the first time through it. It is a great free discovery tool, but I think it's a good idea to not just say thank you, TikTok, but look at it critically and expect a bit more. That's my take. Feel free to share your thoughts with me. As of recording time, the dispute is ongoing, but knowing my luck, they will probably reach a consensus by the time this episode drops or soon after. Or maybe not. Maybe it'll be very ongoing. Either way, I will keep you up to date as much as I can. Now let's talk about award show controversies. There were so many this year. I'm going to have to quickly just kind of whip through them. So many end of the year 2023 Asian award shows were plagued with issues from technical issues to more ticket scalping. Some people are just so fed up. The artists too. Like Bam Bam even said, I'm never going to those again. Not sure if he can do that contractually, but I would understand if he didn't. Despite the show's declining in viewership, the quality, the pressure to make a higher quality show to boost viewership appears to not be a thing. There were safety concerns, like when Ten fell off of this lift at one show. He did sustain no major injuries, but that one instance really upset me and angered me because another SM Entertainment artist, Wendy, fell. I mean, that was a devastating injury. Broken bones and stuff. She was out for so long. You'd think after that they would have changed something about how closely they ensure artist safety or even have a contractual thing, putting in writing, hey, you need to have these safety features tested before we will let our artists back up on your construction, product, whatever. But anyway, there were also safety issues because one K-pop event took place despite a 7.6 magnitude earthquake in Japan the day before. 
In Japan, it feels especially wrong to still have your concert. I know it actually is very hard and can be very expensive to cancel an event. You could be on the hook for a lot of money contractually if you pull out. But wow, given the historical context of the life changing earthquake Japan had to deal with years ago, to take an earthquake is such a trivial thing that won't disrupt your plans in Japan feels especially offensive, in my opinion. There were security concerns too, because a bodyguard had to intercept this guy who was able to jump over a safety line trying to reach Espa on the red carpet. There were then ticket issues with ticket purchasers blocked from entering due to their tickets being fraudulent. Police did arrest a suspected scalper. There were production issues, like at one point during ITZY set, the error screen was an accident, not part of the concept. New Jeans music played mid Stray Kids performance. Zero Base One had tech sound issues. It was messy stuff. There were also people mad at the venue choice. The KBS Music Bank Global Fest chose Japan, disappointing the fans who couldn't travel there. They also initially planned to premiere the unreleased show clips as Amazon Prime Video Japan exclusives, but in response to backlash, they did offer replays. KBS also hoped to make up for fans' disappointment by having a lot of local acts added to the lineup, but that did nothing to quell the frustrations. Anyway, Eastern and Western award shows alike, I could go on and on, so many K-pop artists have been recognized, so that's the bright side. The Korean First Brand Awards, the I Heart Radio Awards, the People's Choice Awards, the Circle Chart Awards, the Golden Disc Awards, etc. Plus New Jeans, our Billboard's Woman of the Year, honored with a special L.A. ceremony. CJ E&M's Vice Chair won the Abu Dhabi Festival Award. And the CJ E&M 2024 Visionary Honorees include Stray Kids, Um Jun Hua, and Monica from Street Woman Fighter. Next up, let's talk programming updates. There is a new reality show from the producer of Exchange. The literal translation is siblings' relationship. The premise is basically siblings meddling in each other's love lives on purpose, which sounds pretty good. It's set to premiere in early March with MCs Bam Bam, Neon, and others. South Korean Broadband is producing a new web show starring TXT's Taehyun. The literal title translation, story about me from idol to student in my past life. He's set to explore different academies and meet different kinds of students. He also will play a protagonist in a related web novel. There are new MCs, including for M Countdown, Sohee from Rise, and Jaehyun from Boy Next Door, on Weekly Idol, Boom and Golden Child's Jang Joon, and Idol Radio Season 4's DJ will be Sun Woo from The Boys. Rain's Disney Plus show, as of recording time, is still on the way. Red Swan did get delayed, but is now set to come out this year. In terms of musical theater, Monster X member Shonu will make his debut in March in Natasha Pierre in The Great Comet of 1812. Becco from New East is starring in Marie Antoinette, the musical, and Kim Sung Kyu was tapped to star in Dear Evan Hansen. Lastly, the Disney movie Wish, which already premiered in the U.S., will come to South Korean theaters this year, with IVE member An Yoo Jin singing the Korean version of the song Wish. Concerning story next, from North Korea. North Korean teens were recently sentenced to 12 years of hard labor for watching K-dramas, because K-content, period, is banned in North Korea. There was actually the Sunshine Policy era when South Korea gave tons of humanitarian aid to North Korea with no strings attached. The Sunshine era ended in 2010. Once Seoul determined, we're not getting reciprocated here. It's not, you would do the same for me, right? It's, no, we wouldn't. So they stopped trying. They also suspected the aid was not going fairly to the intended recipients. Since then, there have been blockades on South Korean content in North Korea. Usually, if you're caught watching a K-drama or something similar, you'll get a five-year sentence. So 12 years of hard labor, that's what's unusual, the length. Watching or distributing South Korean entertainment was made punishable by up to death in 2020. Footage of the arrests, which is actually a bit dated, but it recently was brought to light and given to the BBC through these defectors, this defector-assisting group, SAND, South and North Korean Development. 
The footage shows two 16-year-olds handcuffed and put in front of hundreds of kids in the stadium while officers scold the boys and shame them and claim they're being brainwashed, basically, by South Korean propaganda. The event also was kind of a public doxing, with their names and addresses revealed to a crowd. I know, the stuff of literal nightmares. That public shaming video is now spread in North Korea as like a, a warning video, a deterrent. What's interesting and really alarming is the specifically South Korean hatred of outside media influence. North Korea does like to keep out outside pop culture, but especially South Korea. As one defector told the BBC, quote, If you get caught watching an American drama, you can get away with a bribe. But if you watch a Korean drama, you get shot, unquote. Speaking of concerning crackdowns, the group May Day is in trouble. Yes, I know the jokes you could make. May Day is in trouble with China alleging they lip-synced. China prohibits lip-syncing in front of a paying audience. Like, if you're just having free karaoke night with your friends, go ahead and lip-sync. But it's not legal to lip-sync in front of paying customers. And they accuse May Day of doing so, which they've denied. May Day pledged to cooperate with the investigation, which was launched after the allegation was posted to Weibo back in November 2023. So based on a social media post from months ago, Chinese authorities have investigated what May Day may have lip-synced, so they could be found guilty of deception. It's unclear how they would be punished, probably just a fine. The publication Reuters got an internal report, which indicates possibly what happened, is what the report speculates, is that May Day were urged to put a certain political statement in their live show, say something on the mic, which they refused to. So the threat for doing so was the government cooking up a, an accusation. I'll link to the Reuters report on my site with the other sources, as always. Around the time of this incident, an article was published that encouraged a crackdown on guilty of deception entertainers and more oversight over potential violators. So it's kind of like they're making an example out of this group, which you could interpret in different ways for different motives. I have no idea if they really lip synced or not. It is totally, totally beyond my cultural familiarity to comprehend lip syncing in the context of a crime. So I don't even know how to think about it in that context. I mean, if that was a crime in the US, I don't know where any of our artists would be. I'll keep you posted. Lastly, before the lightning round, an iconic Japanese girl group broke up. Chai is no more. They've decided to part ways and just go on their own creative paths. So I support them, but I'm also really sad about this. They really channeled a unique neo kawaii branding. They really had this unique way of approaching kawaii culture, a kawaii style. They put their own spin on this aesthetic and sonic realm that they were in. They were very creative with it, and I would argue real trailblazers in many ways. They didn't constrain themselves at all. They really were limitless with coloring outside the lines. They started back in 2012, and they just kept putting so much effort into their career. Their debut album didn't come out till 2017, and they really started to pick up traction ever since. And they signed to Sony Music. They then got signed to a U.S. label in 2020. They earned supporters like Damon Albarn of Gorillaz. They worked with Duran Duran. They went to South by Southwest in the U.S., I mean, they were making it globally. So honestly, I was pretty shocked. They just abruptly dropped this news. The main upside I try to focus on when a band breaks up is that we'll end up with four times the exciting new music or whatever the number is of the band in question. But always remember when a band breaks up, you get four times the new music now or five times or however many go on to pursue solo stuff. And they each could do something super cool solo and hopefully a reunion tour could happen way down the road. Fingers crossed. How about a lightning round of more of what has happened in the world of K-pop and beyond the past month or so? Lisa from Blackpink has made headlines left and right. She was cast in The White Lotus Season 3, which actually I shouldn't have been surprised by because it's set in Thailand. They would be foolish not to try to at least get her mentioned in the show. A book is reportedly being written about her life, half fictional, half biographical, so with two storylines. Other than that, though, not much is known so far, although the publisher behind The Da Vinci Code is set to produce this. And she started, out loud, her own agency. 
In terms of new full-time KOMCA membership, Korean Music Copyright Association, the junior members that have been upgraded to full-time membership per board of director voting include Jun s o y e o n from G-Idol, Bo Four, An Ye Eun, the producer 250, who did some New Jeans remixes recently, Jungkook, Vernon from Seventeen, and others. Jesse has already switched companies. Less than a full calendar year after signing with Jay Park's More Vision, she changed her vision and has her sights set on who knows what next. Maybe e l l o u d her and Lisa together doing something that'd be so dope. Meanwhile, p e n a m e c o left P Nation after three years. Yuna from Girls' Generation renewed her SM Entertainment contract for a third time. Irene from Red Velvet also recently renewed. And Red Velvet member s u l g i recently started her own YouTube channel. Five members left the group Great Guys when their contracts expired February 1st. C9 Entertainment clarified what's happening with Signature, since member Bell, Jin Hyunju, made it into the final universe ticket reality show group, Eunice. So now she's gonna spend the next two and a half years promoting with Eunice. The statement did not clarify as to whether or not she will go back to being a full official promoting signature member after the two and a half years. I'm not sure if that's because the group didn't plan to last longer than that or she doesn't know, hasn't made up her mind, or the company doesn't know what they want her status to be. I'm not sure what it was, but they kept it unclear what happens after the two and a half years now. A new BTS comic is coming from Tidal Wave Comics. It's only 22 pages long. Not sure how I feel about it. It's part of the Fame series. The company's also issued comics about Taylor Swift, Beyonce. Attract announced 5050's future plan, kind of, vaguely, saying the new group lineup will ideally be finalized in April. Then they'll have a comeback around June. Their exact wording, around June. A Song of the Summer could be a big pivot point back to Cupid level fame for 50-50. Let's give them the deserved, renewed momentum. SM Entertainment also announced their plans for this year. As of recording time, the plan is, in March, there will be NCT Dream and Wendy comebacks. In addition to SM10 Live 2024 in Tokyo, t a e o n s first solo show, and t e n s first fan con, concerts are also set for ESPA and NCT Dream in the second half of the year. And the second half of the year will also feature another t e n fan con, as well as a fan con for the Super Junior subunit LSS. As usual, Fashion Month, Milan Fashion Week, Paris Fashion Week, etc. really has K-pop stars everywhere. At Gucci, Chanel, Prada, Louis Vuitton, Tommy Hilfiger, you name it and their A-listers at those events. Some attendees include members of TWICE, ESPA, DPR Ian, RISE, The Boys, IU, Bam Bam, members of New Jeans, Jay Park, AEG won the naming rights to a new Nagoya, Japan arena. The 17,000-seat arena will be called the IG Arena, since the online trading and investment firm they've partnered with is called IG Group. So they got super clever there. Meanwhile, a new venue in Bangkok, Thailand opened up called UOB Live on the sixth floor of a mall. Ed Sheeran was the opening act February 11th, breaking ground for that new venue and posing for pics with one of my all-time faves, Jeff Sutter, really, really got me excited to see them together. Hopefully they swap numbers. Size Gundam Style is the first Korean video and the fifth ever in YouTube history video, fifth ever, to surpass 5 billion YouTube views. BTS's Dynamite is certified diamond in France, which is only their second song to get that designation. I love this. I am such a sucker for punny titles like this. The boy group All Hours, All Ours, with the H in parentheses, named their fandom officially The Minute with the U and the T in parentheses. So out of the parentheses, it says mine. So All Ours, Mine, and then All Hours, Minute. That's good. That's clever. Bam Bam had quite a whiplash of good and bad news, canceling his U.S. tour due to a worsened ankle injury, but announcing he now reps Louis Vuitton. Jun Hyuk is back to working with TNX after a health-related hiatus. 
Meanwhile, Goyu left Blitzers permanently for health reasons. Nine Nine member Winnie also announced a permanent leave due to a shoulder muscle rupture that could actually just keep getting worse if he kept up strenuous choreo. Each ITZY member launched their own solo Instagram account. Ayumi from Sugar is pregnant. Congrats on the marriage to AOA member Yuna and producer and Galactica member Friday. Espa's Ningning Ning is Versace's newest global ambassador. And Espa's Karina is now the face of Converse in Korea. Alexa was on the Kelly Clarkson show. Bumgi from TXT joined Instagram. Jisoo from Tahiti welcomed her first child. ATs are now modeling the beauty brand Nasific. Congrats to new parents Hoon from UKIS and Twain Jisoon. Farewell to Woods, who is enlisted. Ricky's TWS already surpassed 100 million TikTok views. And IU just joined TikTok. Ninji from New Jeans rose from South Korea Chanel ambassador to global Chanel ambassador status. Several Lunate members are now on a hiatus due to a minor car accident. The Rose launched a Black Rose fragrance at blackrosefragrances.com. G Idol started repping the local brand Frank Burger. Meanwhile, Yuki is now a Fendi ambassador. Yeah, they really do it all. Tencent Entertainment Group recently announced they will cooperate with Hanteo and Circle Charts. So K-pop music bought through Tencent-owned Chinese streaming services like QQ Music. Music bought through that will finally count towards Circle and Hanteo chart totals. Blackpink's Jisoo now reps Alo Yoga. Stray Kids member Felix became the youngest member of UNICEF's Honors Club because of how much he's donated. Congrats to Top Dog member Gone, who's getting married to Jundaya. And lastly, one of my favorite people, Taeyeon. He recently reached 5 million TikTok followers, and Shalala surpassed 30 million Spotify streams. I will definitely have a lot to say, maybe in its own standalone episode, maybe a write-up on Substack, we'll see. But in some form, I will be talking a lot about his new album. So get ready for that February 26th, and make sure I can continue to give you in-depth coverage of your favorites and their music by sustaining this work. We are still not in the clear, so 17 Karat K-Pop will shut down if I can't make this work through 2024. This is the make or break year, so please, please, please do what you can to sustain it. Info about how to donate, become a paying subscriber regularly or not, one time or repeated, and just ways to help with free word of mouth promo. All in the episode description. Really appreciate the support and I really need you all. Thank you for coming through for me so far. Let's keep it up. Thank you as always so much for tuning in and for your patience as I navigate this transition phase of my life with a a kind of haphazard release schedule. I truly can't put into words how much I appreciate your support. So thank you again, and I'll talk to you all again before you know it. Bye, everybody.